Kid Creek Mines people, uh, when George Mannard was the head of that, uh, that company, he uh, rewarded his people for discovering Kid Creek by taking him on a field trip to Japan, to the, to the Hokuroka district, and asked me to come along. So, great, I did, and that was my first exposure. And these deposits, they're, you know, they're Miocene in age, you know, 13 million years, they're not deformed, they're not metamorphosed, they're, 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 they're sitting just as they form, more or less. And I'm working on these deformed things in Canada. Did some work at Kid Creek, but uh, mostly in Aranda. Okay, here are these deposits. Uh, we've, we've looked at the metalliferous sediments around them. That's with Stavros Kaliropoulos, a Greek graduate student I had, uh, trying to use them as tracers in towards the deposits. Didn't work very well. I mean, the, the, the mere fact you've got a metalliferous sediment on a particular volcanic horizon is good in the sense it's hydrothermal in origin, so you know that something happened on that horizon. But I was hoping to find vectors leading in towards the deposit. And a delightful, fateful day, I, I looked, opened up the National Geographic, I think it was a December 1979 issue, and there was a photograph of, the, of, of a black smoker on the seafloor. A chimney structure with, with this, this very hot water, which is black in color. And I said, There's the answer. I've got to get involved in this. I was at a, at a Gordon conference, and there I met John Edmund, who was a chemist. Um, but he's a guy, uh, together with his students, that did an awful the, the original work on the uh, fluid chemistry of uh, the seafloor hydrothermal systems. He said, well, you know, he'd been going around to universities uh, giving talks about these things on the seafloor, and nobody was interested. There was no interest at all. And I said, well, where'd you go? He told me. He said, well, you know, they don't study VMS deposits in those places. I said, you come up to Toronto, and I guarantee you, uh, you will get a huge audience. Well, we brought him up. Uh, the room held 50 people, another 50 people in the hallway listening. And I said, I want to get involved in this, how do I do it? Um, well, he said, we've got a cruise coming up uh, in, the, in the Wyoming Basin of, uh, between Baja, California and Mexico. And so I went. Um, it was a memorable thing. It was a real career changer. I went on a, on a ship from Scripps, I don't know, half a dozen scientists, I guess, on it, uh, John Edmund. Karen Von Dam, his student, and, and a couple of others. And um, we went out, uh, and we were to meet the Lulu, which was carrying Alvin, the Alvin submersible. And this is in January of uh, 1982. Uh, it was steaming north up, up the Gulf, and we were going south to, to meet at just over the Wymas uh, site, um, which is a known hydrothermal site. I was the first ore deposit geologist from anywhere, and the first Canadian ever to see a black smoker. And I was down there looking at these things in, in awe. And because you, you know you read about it, but it, until you actually see something yourself, you don't understand the, the actual process or the scale. And and I realized that these things could be ore deposits in their own right. And, and they, I wanted to study them because I wanted to understand how ore deposits form, you know, VMS deposits form. You know, the Japanese have told us in the, in the early 1900s they formed by hot spring activity. And Dick Stanton said the same thing in the, in the 50s, and, and uh, nobody read Japanese, so we didn't know about it, and, and people didn't believe Dick Stanton at first. Uh, subsequently, in 1983, went out uh, with Verena Tunnicliffe, uh, her postdoc, Kim Juniper, who's now a professor at UVic, and, uh, and, uh, and others from the University of Washington. And uh, we went to Axial Volcano on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And with the with the uh, Pisces Canadian Pisces submersible, you know, the Canadian government uh, was funding this. Um, it was Jim Franklin who was, who at the survey had engineered some of this uh, because uh, there was a boundary dispute between the United States and Canada as to where the marine boundary went between the state of Washington and the province of British Columbia. And uh, and so it's a case of use it or lose it. Now, we weren't finding any hydrothermal things. And then there was my time to die again came up uh, together with Dick Chase and with Keith Shepard as the pilot. Well, if I go to the intersection of the Axis fault as it comes across the floor of the caldera and the caldera wall, I should find something. Hey, we did. We were coming down with a submersible. And I said, my God, they're tube worms. Um, and so then I knew that we had found a uh, hydrothermal system. And pointed out that Dick Chase, because he's looking out the other side, he couldn't see it and Keith Shepard, and we all got very excited, uh, and we're, we're taking photographs left, right, and center. Uh, Keith was getting excited too, and he forgot to adjust the CO2 scrubber, and so the CO2 level <laughs> went way up in the submersible, 
uh, the, I remember the windows kind of fogged over on the inside because we're breathing so heavily. Yeah, it was exciting, really exciting. And went from there, again, the Canadian government was concerned that, uh, about offshore stuff and so forth. Uh, again, Jim Franklin was pulling the levers in the background. He was, uh, he was at this time the chief the geologist in the Geological Survey. Um, we had actually kind of a neat arrangement. Uh, he, as a government employee, couldn't say some things that he wanted to say, but I could. And then subsequently, uh, Verena Tonycliffe went out with the, with the Pisces submersible and, and found what she called Magic Mountain, which is a large sulfide deposit on Explorer Ridge. On a lecture tour in Australia uh, in 1984, I think. It was. Uh, one of the talks I gave was at CSIRO in North Ride, uh, Sydney Supper. And uh, I was giving one of my C4 talks there. And that evening, Joan, my wife, uh, as I was sorting slides, this is the day of 35 millimeter slides, she was uh, reading the, the, one, uh, the, the classified ads of the Sydney Morning Herald. She came across this ad uh, announcing that CSIRO had a ship called the Franklin. And they were looking for things to do, an oceanographic vessel. And the, the name Shaughnessy, I think, was on it. So I phoned up Ray and said, Ray, do you realize you've got a ship? It's an oceanographic vessel, and it's CSIRO. Presumably you can get it, and we can go out and do something. Um, so Ray and I had lunch with Shaughnessy a, a few days later, and uh, and we applied for ship time, and uh, well, actually, well, he mostly, because it's a CSIRO thing. And Pat Lark was born. Pat New Guinea, Australia, Canada, in the Woodlark Basin. And we had our first cruise in about 1980, oh, 88 or thereabouts, some, something like that, to the Woodlark Basin, which is in Papua New Guinean waters. Ray and I were looking for hydrothermal things. You know, we're, we're both ore deposits guys. We, we photographed iron oxides, large areas of, of, of iron oxides. And we also, you know, had, had, well, basically did, did the basic geology there. Um, Subsequently, I think it was 1990, uh, the Russians were doing a series of, uh, of dives in, in the, covering the, almost the entire Western Pacific, and they wanted to do some work at Woodlark. Uh, they invited us along. I, one of the dives I was on went into the cold era. I was you know, interested in the iron oxides, um, and but there was this spire sitting there. Got it up uh, on deck and looked at it. It was heavy. It was barite. It was some silica and a little bit of pyrite, like 2% pyrite. Subsequently, we did analyses and it had uh, several PPM gold in it. In fact, we did a fair amount of work at what we called Pac Manus. It was a felsic volcanic ridge with, with basalts at the base, basaltic andesites up through into, into a day site on top. Sort of two volcanoes like this and a smaller one here. And these we called Susu, um, and that one uh, we called Suzette. And on Suzette, we found a very large deposit. There's felsic volcanics, there's, there's everything there, everything you'll, you'll, you'll want to find in a, around a VMS. It was a dead ringer from Miranda, for example. His discovery was written up in the New York Times in um, December 1997, maybe. The name of Julian Malnick, whose mother was uh, very well known in Papua New Guinea. Uh, uh, and so he had connections in Papua New Guinea. He formed a company called Nautilus Minerals and staked it. We discovered this Suzette deposit uh, that may end up being the first seafloor deposit to be mined on the ocean floor. This was pure research, and yet it has resulted in a company being formed and a new industry on the seafloor. And, and to me, that's a, a, a beautiful example of why basic research has to be funded, has to be supported by governments.